Hello, and greetings to all you fans of RPGs and of Dungeons and Dragons. This is RPG Mods Fan, and in this video, I will be reviewing and discussing the Dungeons and Dragons module B3 Palace of the Silver Princess, which was written by TSR's first female author, Jean Wells. The B3 module was first briefly published by TSR in 1981. Then it was edited by Tom Moldave and republished again in the same year. The republished version of it has made a number of changes to it. In this video, I will concentrate on the original version of it, which is the orange cover version. Perhaps I should call this video as part 1 and later in the future review the Moldave version and call it part 2. Anyway, this module was meant for beginning level player characters between the levels of 1 to 3. This module was written for basic D&D rules. The Dungeon Master will have some work to do in order to convert it to 5th edition rules. Some of the monsters have been buffed up in 5th edition rules, and some have been buffed down. Some years ago, Wizards of the Coast made the orange cover version of the B3 module available for download from their website for free. They also had other modules, dungeons, and adventures available for download from their website for free. However, all these free modules, dungeons, and adventures were pulled from their website. However, as of 2018, the orange cover version of the B3 module is available for download from the Vaults of Pandius website for free. Supposedly, at the time, this module was very controversial. In my opinion, Jean Wells was made a scapegoat. Soon she left TSR, and it is unclear whether she quit, or was terminated, or was forced to quit. Almost immediately after publishing it, TSR recalled all copies of the module and destroyed them. Less than a hundred survived. I have read and heard many reasons for why the module was recalled. However, I am very skeptical of the reasons given. Something, or in this case, some things, just do not add up. I will briefly mention a few of the reasons. Also, warning, some minor spoilers are ahead. The biggest reason was the supposed controversial artwork in the module. Two in specific. One is where a bondage scene of a woman tied by her own long hair is being poked by nine ugly guys. The second depicts three-headed hermaphrodites with the heads of TSR's management. Now, if the artwork is to be blamed, then the blame should fall on the artist, not on the author of the module. In interviews, Jean Wells herself said she was unhappy with the art, but was unable to have them changed. She stated that the UBs were supposed to be like Siamese triplets and not hermaphrodites. In the Tom Moldave's edited version, both of these drawings were excluded. Also, the other big reason is the SM, sadism and masochism, that is supposedly depicted in the module. One thing to keep in mind is that during this time, the D&D Satanic Panic was happening. TSR, especially its management, became oversensitive to the controversy and being linked to controversial topics such as devil and demon worship, the occult, s &M, etc. So having this module recalled and destroyed was probably an overreaction on TSR's part. Displayed are the credits found within the module itself. Now, 
Notice how many playtesters are listed. If this module was that controversial, then it should have not even passed the playtesting part of the module's development phase. In interviews, former TSR editor and artist Stephen D. Sullivan stated that Gene Wells was a fan of John Norman's Gore novel series. I find that hard to believe. The setting of the novel series takes place on an Earth-like planet that shares the same orbit as Earth, but is always on the opposite side of the Sun. The Gore novel series is very misogynistic, where women are mainly slaves, are branded as such, and brutalize. Even princesses are considered as second-class citizens in the series. In an interview, Jean Wells herself stated that, at the time of writing this module, she did not even know what S&M was. Okay, time to discuss the module itself. I will paraphrase what Jean Wells said in an interview. I was asked to make a teaching module. I remember trying to use Gygax monsters for the most part, as we were supposed to, but also creating a few just for the module that were really different. I also wanted to add a little scenery, such as non-player characters, who could be used to gain information from. Mountains, hills, and things like that where outside monsters can lurk all leading up to the palace. I was trying to show the players and the dungeon masters that there was more to a dungeon than just the building. I did not complete the palace, allowing the DM the freedom to expand it as he or she sees fit. I was assuming that beginner dungeon masters were trying to learn to set up their own world and I was trying to help. This adventure takes place in the fantasy world of Mastara, on the continent of Brun. On the continent of Brun, this adventure takes place within a minor barony within the country of Glantry. A council of hereditary princes and a parliament of minor nobles rule Glantry. Glantry is effectively a magetocracy a government ruled by mages, similar to the country of Thay in the Forgotten Realms setting. The module's prologue opens. Years ago, the valley was green, and animals ran free through the golden fields of grain. The Princess Arjanta ruled over this peaceful land, and the people were secure and happy. Then, one day, a warrior riding on a red dragon appeared in the skies over the princess's castle, and almost overnight the tiny kingdom fell into ruin. Now only ruins and rumors remain, and what legends there are tell of a fabulous ruby still buried somewhere within the palace of the Silver Princess. The module's plot hook is that the player characters somehow learn of the ruby that once belonged to Princess Arjanta, aka the Silver Princess, and journey to her ruined palace to search for it. I will now be discussing the module itself, and the rest of this video will contain spoilers. Unless you are a dungeon master who will be running this module for their players, or are a player who already played through this module and are watching this video for nostalgia purposes, I would suggest not to watch the rest of this video. The aforementioned ruby is called My Lady's Heart. Its legend is as follows. Princess Arjanta was a beloved princess. The dwarves mining in her domain found a ruby the size of an apple. The dwarves cut it to the shape of a heart 
and the elves polished it and fashioned it into a piece of jewelry. Then they presented it as a gift to the princess. The princess held a grand masquerade ball to honor the dwarves and elves. The ruby caught the eye of many attendees at the ball. Many weeks after the ball, a red dragon being ridden by a man clad in silver and blue armor was seen in the skies. The dragon burned and scorched the lands. The palace is in ruins and no one knows what happened to the princess. Some believe that the man on the dragon carried her away. Others think that he killed her and stole what treasure he could find. But all these stories say that the ruby, my lady's heart, is still hidden in the palace. Goluvia serves as the capital of the region where the adventure takes place. It is a medieval-styled city ruled by a ruthless, terror-inducing tyrant called Lady Demis. She became the Baroness by murdering her husband, the former Baron. She enacted laws that almost make males as second-class citizens. Lady Demis is also a distant cousin to Princess Arshanta. Traveling these lands are a tinker named Lam Damon and his daughter named Zapora. These NPCs can serve as a source of information and rumors for the player characters, as well as a trading and repair shop. The DM should have the player characters encounter these NPCs as soon as possible and build a rapport with them. As an idea for the opening scene of this adventure, have the player characters traveling on the roads, then they hear desperate sounds of battle. When the player characters hopefully run to investigate, they will see Lam Damon and Zapora being attacked by bandits, kobolds, or orcs. The rest of the scene is left up to the player characters and the dungeon master to play out. The inhabited places are as follows. Dead Mule is a town currently occupied by the Baroness's soldiers. Mare is a halfling village. Escaped slaves and prisoners come here seeking temporary shelter and then equipping themselves before journeying north into and through the Misty Swamp. Spells do not work properly within the Misty Swamp. Nassau is a small farming village. Thorold is another village, but is famed for breeding thoroughbred horses. Valdirs is a hamlet. Due to kobolds, orcs, and other goblin-kind creatures living in the abandoned woods, this hamlet has not had much of a chance to grow. The city, town, and villages will have one or more taverns and or inns where the player characters can learn or hear rumors. Some true, some false. Throw in an encounter or two of goblin kind creatures to the player characters during their mountainous trek to the ruined palace of the Silver Princess, just to emphasize how dangerous the more foul mountains are to the common folk. Catharan Damus, ugh, that's a, what a damn long name. Catharan Damus is a male human third level cleric, along with his three companions, occupy a portion of the palace. He is careful and clever. He has an odd sense of humor and will not fully trust anyone and will always have an escape or some other plan ready. Cathar Randamus is a user of people. The module leaves it up to the dungeon master to decide why he and his companions are in the palace. Perhaps he's trying to use this area as a base of operations. 
Perhaps he is hiding from the revenge of Lady Demis. Perhaps he seeks to obtain the My Lady's Heart Ruby without getting killed by the two ghosts that protect it. Or perhaps he is looking for secret knowledge or powerful magic buried in the collapsed tunnels under the palace. This module does have a number of flaws, but I tend to overlook those flaws when it gives the villains some personalities and character as this one does. Alea is a third level fighter. She was once human, but she was bitten by a werebear and infected with lycanthropy early in her life. Since then, she has been drifting from place to place. She moves on each time the local peasants or soldiers come too close to discovering her secret. Catharan Damis learned of her secret and realized she would be a powerful servant. She now looks on him as a kindly father figure and will fight to protect him. Catharan Damis does not really care about her, though he is careful not to let her know of this. Zizom and Baron are both male dwarven third level fighters. They are Catharan Damis's bodyguards. The module suggests that the DM give these dwarves an ulterior motive. Perhaps they are outcasts who have joined Catharan Damis for loot. Perhaps they are spying for the dwarven king looking for a precious dwarven treasure buried below the palace. One or two things that this villain party lacks is a thief and a mage. Perhaps they did have a thief and a mage, but they have met their demise coming to or in the palace. Many of the rooms and areas of the ruined palace are described. Also, Jean Wells has added monsters, traps, and treasure in quite a number of them. However, since this is supposed to be a teaching module for the new Dungeon Master, a number of rooms were left blank for the DM to fill with monsters and treasure as they see fit. The most ridiculed monster that this module debuts is called the Bubbles, which are encountered in Cavern Number 1D. Bubbles were a result of countless unsuccessful magical potion experiments that were discarded into the water in this cave. After years of this thoughtless dumping, the potions mixed together to create these sentient bubble monsters. Within this room, there is a chance the player characters will encounter two kleptomaniacs named Candela and Duchess. If the player characters do not meet Candela and Duchess here, then have them meet these two attractive thieves elsewhere in the palace. They are trying to loot the place and are now in way over their heads. Hence, they are willing to join the party on a temporary basis. As a DM, I like the idea of reoccurring characters and NPCs. In my prior videos on the D&D modules B1 and B2, I gave a few suggestions on how the player characters can encounter Candela and Duchess in those modules as well. As a DM, I would have them make an appearance in a few future adventures as well, where they are getting into trouble and help is needed from the player characters to get them out of it. Within this room, dominated by four statues, is the princess's diary. In it, the player characters will learn the following. A fighter clad in silver and blue armor came to her home, won her love, and then they married. Nothing else is written after the fourth day of their marriage. The diary does mention my lady's heart being somewhere in the living quarters of the palace 
hidden in a twig wood jewel case. In literature, a diary is a common form of an exposition plot device. Yet, the diary being here and untouched seems a little too convenient for the player characters, as well as being out of place. There is a pit in the floor of this passage. It will be activated by the first person stepping onto it, and triggered by the second person who steps onto it. Once triggered, the floor will swing open and drop whatever is on it into a 10-foot deep pit. After one round, small openings will appear in the walls and oil will pour out into the pit. The oil will continue to spill forth until it lies one inch or two and a half centimeters deep over the entire surface area of the floor. As soon as this occurs, another wall opening will appear and an unlit torch will fall into the oil. If you are a cruel DM, you could have the torch lit instead of being unlit. This room is a torture chamber, and a old, crazed, first-level fighter named Travis will appear here within one round. I find lots of things wrong with this scene and room. 1. Given how idyllic the Silver Princess is portrayed to be, I find it doubtful that she would condone torture and have a torture chamber in her palace. The palace also has a prison. That I can understand, but not a torture chamber. Unless, as a DM, you make the former princess a closet, evil, manipulative, torture-loving tyrant. Hmm. Given the way Baroness Demis is described, I guess it runs in the family. And two, Travis is described as an old warrior. To me, being an old warrior means he is experienced. So why is he only at first level? The guard tower of the palace is guarded by the protectors. Protectors are another new monster that this module introduces. However, as a monster and as to why they are here makes little logical sense to me. On the upper level of the palace, the former princess's bedroom can be found. Although lavishly furnished, nothing of value or knowledge can be found here. Here is the princess's sitting room with a magical singing teacup. Above the fireplace is a painting of her. This is a room where three Ubus make their lair. Currently, they are cooking stew. The walls are covered in portraits and other scenic paintings. Most of the portraits are of Lady Agenta or of the Silver Warrior. One is of the Red Dragon, but it has been slashed in several places. A few more Ubus can be found elsewhere in the palace. Here is where the garden of the palace can be found, which is now overgrown with weeds. The garden has two types of deadly plants. Both make their debut as new monsters in this module. One is a Jupiter bloodsucker. The other are eight archer bushes. Displayed is the original artwork of this version of the module. For some reason, TSR's management found this drawing as offensive and replaced it with this one in the green-covered Tom Moldave edited version. When the player characters enter this room, they will see a beautiful young woman hangs from the ceiling. Nine ugly men are poking into her flesh, taunting her and pulling at what few clothes she has on. Part of her ankle-length hair 
has been wrapped around her legs, securely binding them together, while the rest of her hair has been used to tie her hands to the ceiling beam. This is an illusion created by a decapus. The decapus monster makes its debut in this module. As its name implies, it has ten tentacles extending from various parts of its body. This hidden chamber can only be accessed by a secret door. Within it, a single pedestal with a glass case on top of it stands in the center of this room. A small brown box with strange runes carved into it is inside the glass case. As a DM, I would also add the corpse of a thief by the pedestal. This thief appears to have once been of extreme old age when alive, and has a frightened expression on his or her face. Within the brown teakwood box is my lady's heart ruby. Anyone touching the glass case will cause both Lady Argenta and her knight in silver and blue armor to appear. They are not illusions, they are ghosts. Chamber number 28 is where the player characters will encounter the villain party. Catherine Damis, Aaliyah, Zizon, and Baron. If the party is very strong, these villains should be reinforced with other characters, such as acolytes, berserkers, goblins, and or hobgoblins, to give the player characters a tough fight if things go that way. Displayed is a list of monsters this module debuts. A number of these monsters were removed from the green-covered Tom Moldave edited version of this module. The drawings, maps, and art of the module were done by Jeff D., David S. LaForce, Errol Otos, Jim Rosloff, Laura Rosloff, Stephen D. Sullivan, Gene Wells, and Bill Willingham. Most of the module's art have already been displayed within this review. For the art and drawings that I have not yet displayed, I will do so towards the end of this video. Thank you for watching. Hope this video has been informative and entertaining. I love many types of role-playing games, especially Dungeons and Dragons. Inclusive in my perverse wayward love is computer role-playing games, such as Divinity Original Sin 1 and 2, the first two Dragon Age games, Baldur's Gate, Dragon's Dogma Dark Arisen, and others. I have created a playlist of classic D&D modules composed of videos from various YouTube channels. I noticed some gaps in it, so in the foreseeable future, I plan on filling in some of those gaps. Till next time, this is RPG Mods Fan saying cheers, have a good day, and goodbye. This is starting to win.